Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Don Morrill. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Technology Council here. And we're very pleased to be partnering once again with the Internet Society uh, to bring these uh, educational seminars to, to the New York City audience. A uh, quick word about NITEC. We are a New York City-based trade association whose mission is to help our member companies grow and thrive as they uh, grow their technology companies here in New York. Uh, we work closely with organizations such as the Internet Society uh, and other nonprofits throughout the area to bring educational seminars and resources to our member companies. Uh, real quick, I'd like to uh, introduce our 2012 sponsors, uh, Eisner Amper, Google, TGP Associates, Verizon, Information Builders, and for 2012, I'm happy to announce two new sponsors in IBM and the law firm of Frankfurt Kernet. Uh, if anybody's interested in sponsorship or membership, uh, January starts our, our membership drive, so please feel free to visit us at nytech.org or see myself uh, after the event. Also, I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Parsons New School for hosting us here tonight at this great facility. Real quick, we've got two uh, upcoming events uh, this month. This Monday, we have a cutting edge technology showcase which, in which we'll be featuring some of the cool new technology that's being developed here in New York City. That's gonna be at Google. We're showcasing two Google technologies as well as some interesting 3D modeling technology, some 3D printing technology, and some augmented reality technology uh, as well. On Wednesday, January 25th, we have an event entitled Too Big to Know where the author David Weinberger from Clue Train Manifesto fame will be talking about his upcoming book, uh, Too Big to Know. And if you're interested in those, again, you can check them out on our website, nytech.org. And that's all I have. I'd like to introduce my counterpart at the Internet Society, David Solonoff, and then we'll jump into our speakers. Our first speaker, Shai from IBM, and our second speaker, unfortunately, is stuck in Bangkok, Thailand, of all places. So he's going to be joining us by Skype for the second half of the presentation. So bear with us a little bit as we work through some technology issues. I'm David Solonoff, president of the Internet Society of New York, and we're in the New York chapter of the Global Internet Society, which works to develop uh, uh, an open, uh, promote the open development of uh, standards and protocols for the Internet and advocate for the open access to the Internet. Uh, today we have uh, two presenters uh, talking about uh, securing the cloud. Uh, at this point, uh, a lot of enterprises hesitate to use uh, cloud-based uh, services because of security concerns. It's technically possible to secure data when it's at rest and when you're storing data. It's technically possible to secure data when you're transmitting it and receiving it when it's in transit. But at the point when data is being processed, it's processed in the clear which means that if you don't trust a service provider uh, or a systems administrator uh, to, you know, to process your data, then you're not going to uh, uh, use it in the cloud unless you build it yourself. So this is kind of the big obstacle uh, in terms of uh, cloud security. And today we have two approaches to that, which are the opposite. One is uh, Shai uh, Holiday. Um, we'll talk about a really fascinating new technology he's working on which involves actually processing data in encrypted form. So in other words, the computer is uh, manipulating data, but it, but it doesn't know what it is. So he'll, I'm not sure I understand how that can be done, but he'll explain to us. Uh, the other alternative approach is uh, from uh, Michael DeJong's uh, open source project on hosted.org. There, what they do is they store the data in the cloud and the software in the cloud, but bring it together on a local trusted computer to actually do the data processing. So we'll start with Shai. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Shai Halev. I work for IBM Research. Um, the thing I'm going to talk about this evening is uh, computing and encrypted data. And the, the premise is that I want to delegate processing of my data without actually giving access. Uh, to it, and the technical means for doing that is to encrypt it and operate on it while it's encrypted. So for example, wouldn't it be nice if I could encrypt my data before I send it to a cloud, to a storage provider, say, 
but I still want the server to be able to do things with this data on my behalf, like search through it, sort it, edit it. Um, the thing that I don't want to have to do every time is to get back the entire data, decrypt it, do the processing myself, encrypt it, and send it back. I would like it to stay out there. I just want to tell the cloud what I want to be done. Take that thing and add five to it. And have that done without the cloud actually being able to see what the actual data is. Uh, similarly, maybe even more interesting, would it be nice to encrypt my queries to the cloud? The data is not mine. The data belongs to the cloud. I just want to do something about it. Uh, I have a query, and I want the cloud to process my query the way it usually does, except I don't want to tell the cloud what the query is. So I'm going to encrypt it. I'm going to send it to the cloud. The cloud would do whatever processing it does, but on encrypted query, rather, on them, query in the clear. And then it gives me back something which is also encrypted, and I'm going to be able to decrypt. Uh, so here is what we're trying to do, outsourcing computation privately. This is our client. I don't know. This is our client. Her name is Alice. Uh, she wants to delegate the computation to the cloud, but the cloud shouldn't be able to see her data. Uh, she has an input. We're going to call this input X. And the cloud is supposed to evaluate some function on that input, call that function F. Um, what she's going to do is take her input encrypted, send it to the cloud, and the point of uh, my presentation this evening uh, is this. Uh, we would like to have this magical box that allows the cloud to take the encrypted input, apply some function that it wants to evaluate on it, and the thing that would come up is the encryption of f of x, the encryption of what would have what the cloud would have computed if it sees the actual X. And then the encryption of X goes back to Alice, and Alice can do it. This is what we want to do. And here's something, suppose we could do that. Here's something that we, uh, one application of it. So I fly to the West Coast, I land at LAX, and I want to uh, drive from there to Santa Barbara. Uh, so I want to get directions for that, and the typical thing that I'm going to do is go to a map server and say, give me the directions from LAX to the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, except I don't want the map server to know where I am or where I'm going to. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to encrypt it, and instead of my query, how do you get from LAX to Santa Barbara, I'm going to send to the server this bunch of unintelligible garbage. Uh, what I'd like to be able to do is for the server to operate on that and comes up with another equally unintelligible piece of uh, text such that when it sends it back to me and I decrypt it, I'm going to get the answer to that query. Uh, so in this case, the answer is I don't really know what the University of California is, but I, don't, I know where Santa Barbara is, so if you want direction, here they are. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that we would like to be able to do. We would like to be able to take any function. In this case, the function was take your query, apply my database to it, and come up with direction. That's a function of something that you may want to compute, and I want to apply that to the encrypted data rather than to the data in the clear. Uh, this has a... Uh, the quest for doing things like that is not new. The original uh, suggestion that something like that can be done came very shortly after the invention of public key encryption uh, by the best Adelman and Vetusus. The first two are, are the two of the inventors of RSA encryption. Um, and they used the following mathematical uh, way of describing it. Uh, so in mathematics, we have these homomorphisms between different spaces. We have a set of... Um, things, mathematical things, and another set of mathematical things, and we have these mappings between them that preserve operations. Um, so in, that, in our context, we have a set of plain texts. These are the actual data that we care about. It's in clear form. Everybody can see it on one hand. On the other side, we have the same data except encrypted. So this is the space of ciphertext. And we have this transformation to map things back and forth between these two spaces. 
we can take clear text, encrypt it, and get a cipher text, or we can take cipher text, encrypt it, and get a clear text. But what we want is for this operation to preserve, uh, for this transformation to preserve some operations. So we have our two plain text data, x1 and x2, and we want to multiply them and get y. We would like to be able to take the encryptions of these x1 and x2, do something with them, and come up with another ciphertext such that when you decrypt it, you get y, the product of x1 and x2. This they call privacy homomorphism. <coughs> homomorphism because there's this transformation that maintain the operation of product, and privacy because it's encryption and it's supposed to be uh, able to work properly. Uh, so for those of you who actually know how RSA encryption looks like, this is an example uh, that uses RSA. RSA, there is a public key, which are two integers that everybody knows. They call E and N in this slide. Uh, and there is this plain text that you want to encrypt that's called X. And roughly speaking, uh, not quite accurate, but close enough, uh, to encrypt X, you just take X and exponentiate, use the exponentiation functions uh, to the power of E modulo N, where E and N are uh, integers that everybody knows. And the encryption is x to the power e modulo n. Um, and for those of you who still remember a little bit of mathematics, uh, because exponentiations and multiplications play nice together, then when you take x1 to the power e and multiply it by x2 to the power e, what you get is x1 times x2 to the power e. All of that modulo this number n. Uh, so this is an example of sorts of something that I would call here a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. There is the RSA encryption scheme, and there are some operations that you can do on encrypted data. In particular, if you have encrypted data A and encrypted data B, you can multiply them and get um, um, encryption of A times, or X1 times X2. Um, so that's all nice and well, but we want to do a little bit more. Clearly, you can think that, well, that's a very algebraic operation. You multiply things. Uh, it <coughs> plays well with the algebra underlying the encryption scheme that we're using. So yeah, maybe we can do that. But we want to do arbitrary functions, very complicated functions. So what we want is an encryption for which you can compute arbitrary function on the data. We want this uh, rainbow box here where you take an encryption of something on one hand, you take arbitrary function that you want to evaluate on the other hand, and out comes the encryption of the function applied to the thing inside of your ciphertext. Uh, here's an, one example to keep in mind. It's a relatively simple example, but it's uh, actually interesting to think of. So think of private information return. Alice, uh, sorry, the server has some database full of data, and it's indexed by number. Think of patent database. Every patent has its number. So there is an, an array of patents. Each patent is indexed by a number. Alice there has a particular number that she is, she's interested in, but she doesn't want the server to know what she's up to. I mean, telling me what patents I'm looking for would probably tell you something about what I'm trying to design. I don't want to do that. So what I want to do is to get that thing encrypted. I'm going to send you an encryption of my index, and I'm going to get back an encryption of the entry. And you shouldn't, you being the server, shouldn't know what my index was. That's called the pilot information retrieval. That's one particular example of functions that we may want to evaluate on encrypted input. Uh, and as opposed to this RSA example that I had before where you multiply things, this is a lot less algebraic type of functions. It's not like we're going to have our crypto system where things are encrypted and, and by chance you multiply them and you get multiplication on the other side. That's a more complicated function. How are we going to uh, compute it? So actually, I'm not going to give all that many details in it. I'm going to say one thing and basically leave it at that. Uh, but here's what you do. It's a two-step process. The first step. Uh, you think of your function and you express it as a Boolean circuit. What that means is take your function and write a description of how to compute that function uh, from logical gates and or not. 
So we all know that every function can be built this way, at least we believe that, because, hey, we can always build hardware to do that, that function, so hardware is made of these gates. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing you notice is that if you have two bits and you want to compute their not, their end, their or, something like that, so a not of a bit, that means if the bit is a one, then map it to zero and the other way around, you can write it as one minus that. Uh, an end of two bits, b1 and b2, is just the product of them. Right? If any of them is zero, then the end is zero. If both of them are one, then the end is one. An or of them is a little more complicated expression, but still uh, fairly simple, and you can write it with pluses, minuses, and things. What that tells you is that if you have an encryption scheme where you could compute multiplication and compute addition and subtraction, uh, then you can compute any functions you want, right? You can just express that function as binary gates and compute all these times and, and minuses and pluses, and you'll be done, and you get your answer. Um, so then step two is come up with an encryption uh, system that supports both addition and multiplication. Um, and this is pretty much what things do for 30 years. So since uh, the idea was uh, I raised the first time uh, in 78, and until two years ago, it seemed like a really interesting problem, uh, and people didn't know how to do it. And not for lack of trying, people did come up with examples of crypto system that uh, you could support both addition and multiplication, and on the face of it, it seems like the crypto system would be secure. And then it turned out that the amount of structure that you needed to put in in order to do addition and multiplication was, <coughs> excuse me, was such that the crypto system was broken. An attacker could use that structure to break this crypto system. Um, until two years ago, well, Craig Gentry uh, proposed the first plausible scheme. And by plausible, I mean a scheme where you can actually compute those things and it's plausible that the scheme is secure. Um, the reason that the, the, it's plausible that the scheme is secure is the same way that RSA encryption uh, builds on the hardness of factoring large in integers, that system builds on some other hard problems, in particular problems in integer lattices, uh, which are fairly well known and fairly well, well studied, not as much as integer factorization, but people have been looked at uh, these mathematical problems and tried to figure out how to do them and couldn't find them. So we have some sort of belief that these problems are really hard, and if they are hard, then that crypto system that Craig Gentry uh, proposed uh, would indeed be secure. And that was 2009, and since then, in the last couple of years, there are many other variants of that or different crypto systems that were proposed along similar lines uh, to do that, to do that. So the take home part of my talk is fully homomorphic encryption is possible. There exist encryption schemes that are secure in the sense that they will reveal no information whatsoever about the thing encrypted there, and yet you can compute on them. You can take ciphertext and multiply them, you can take ciphertext and add them, you can build any function that you want uh, out of that. So that's, you know, that's very nice. Uh, once we resolve the, the, the question of that's actually doable, the next question is, well, how much does this thing cost? And currently, the answer is quite a bit. Um, these encryption systems are workable. You can implement them, but it would cost you. Uh, a little slow. The first working implementation that Craig and I did um, last year took half hour to compute a single AND gate. Uh, now think about it. You have an encryption of one bit here, an encryption of another bit here, and all you want is to compute the end of them. That operation, when you not need to apply it to the ciphertext, take about a half hour on a reasonably powerful machine. We didn't actually need to go to the IBM supercomputers in order to implement it. But, you know, we still needed like 40 gigabyte of RAM and, and fairly strong machines. Uh, if you count, this is maybe 13 or 14 or orders of magnitude slowdown uh, just in order to be able to compute the cycle. So end of two bits is, you know, fairly cheap these days. And end of two encrypted bits is well, more expensive. 
Uh, it was not all bad. We had a dumbed down, down version of that encryption scheme that uh, takes maybe half a second per end rather than half an hour, so it's like three and something orders of magnitude better. Uh, but it, uh, it can only evaluate very simple functions. Well, technically very simple functions are loaded with polynomials, but whatever, there is some class of functions that you can do with it, and the more, in, more uh, complex functions you want to com compute, the slower it takes until you reach this half hour thing, and then you can compute everything. At some point, there's a threshold there. Uh, if you can compute that much, you can now uh, uh, compute it. Uh, so here, just uh, to show you the numbers, this is the dumbed down version. This is a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme in the sense that you can compute some functions, but not others. And these are uh, different sizes of things. Um, so the secure version of it is the bottom line there. The, 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 32,000 something. Uh, the dimension is related to the underlying mathematical problem uh, for that crypto system. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is if you know about RSA encryption, people talk about working with large integers, and the large integers are typically like a 1,000 bit RSA number, a 2,000 bit RSA number, a very secure version, a 20,000 bit RSA number. This one uh, uses a 30 million bit number. So a single number, it would take you a few gigabytes to represent. And then you need to multiply and add these numbers. It, it, it takes some more. That's why, they, that's why it takes so, longer, so long. In this case, half a second per uh, operation. And when you go to the fully homomorphic thing, you not only need to multiply them. There's a big transformation <coughs> underlying it. And it costs you. So as I said, it's a little slow. Uh, my favorite quote from very recently, a quote from Butler Lamson saying, I don't think we'll see any, anyone using Gentry's solution in our lifetime. Uh, I'll get back to the context of that quote in a second. I just say that I just want to say that this is my favorite quote because I'm sort of hoping to prove it wrong. Uh, so, new stuff. During the last couple of months, there have actually been a few more techniques in addition to Gentry's original uh, uh, technique that makes it faster. We don't exactly know how much faster, but they promise something like three orders of magnitude improvement versus the original scheme. So even the fully homomorphic thing, the thing that can compute everything, now instead of half an hour, maybe it would take you only a few seconds per end. That's still quite a few orders of magnitude slower than working with the clear text, but you can see that maybe there are some uh, niche applications where computing an end for in, in three seconds would be uh, manageable. Uh, just like uh, Gentry's original thing, there is um, here, the trade-off is a little different, but you still have the same phenomenon that uh, if you only want to evaluate simple functions, then you can use a simpler version of it, and it will be faster. And I think, again, the difference between evaluating everything and evaluating simple things should be maybe two or three orders of magnitude. So you can think that maybe this very simple functions you can already implement in a few milliseconds per, or a few uh, uh, tens of milliseconds per uh, operation, and that gets you to the place where, for some things, it's actually useful. So with that, what can I use? Suppose I really needed that in my application. It would really help me to be able to allow people to send me their encrypted data and me, and I would be able to work. What can I do? Uh, so here are a few things we can all use today. Sometimes simple functions is all we need. If we wanted to compute statistics, well, average is just adding, and variance is just um, some quadratic function. So in terms of the degree of the functions that you need to it's very low, and we compute it. We can compute it fast. So sometimes this is enough. Um, other things that we can do. Sometimes I don't actually need it to be send your input, get the answer. Maybe I can talk to the server a few times back and forth. The server would compute something. I would do something else and send it. The server should still do most of the work. I don't want to go back to the to the world where the server sends me everything and I'm doing the work. I want the server to do most of the work, but maybe I can help the server every so often in little places, and that would speed it up. There are some examples where this helps, not that many. 
And then there are great efficiency gains when selling for weaker notions of security, and I want to say some things about those. Uh, when I was talking throughout the, the, uh, my talk about encryption, I meant encryption as secure as it gets. You learn absolutely nothing about your inputs. And if you see encryption of many inputs, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's encryption of the same thing or encryption of a different thing. But sometimes you don't need that. So there are notions that are weaker than full-blown secure encryption. For example, there's the notion of order preserving encryption. Each ciphertext, each encrypted data by itself, uh, would look sort of random, but if you look at two of them, you'd be able to say that, hey, this thing contains a number larger than what's in that. That, well, clearly you leaked some information about the thing you encrypted. There are crypto systems that are more efficient that would let you do that particular thing, comparing to them. Then there is this MIT's CryptoDB. Uh, the quote from Butler Lamson was in an article of Forbes from last month talking about MIT's CryptoDB. Uh, this is an actually an encrypted database where you can run SQL queries on this database. And they say 25% slowdown as opposed to non encrypted queries. So clearly a very different technology. They use something like <coughs> encryption. Honestly, I don't know that the, that technology, I don't know what they're doing exactly. I'm going to be there next week, so I guess they'll explain it to me. Uh, but uh, if you settle, and, and when you do these things, and you have an, an onion encryption, and you open the layers every so often, you do learn something about the thing that's encrypted there. You just never see it completely in the clear. So if that's all you need, then that's it. And they have a, a fairly impressive <coughs> number, performance number. Um, so I think I'm done. Let's do it quickly. We'll take Q and A, and I'm going to set up the Skype while you take the Q and A. system that's sort of the easiest to understand. Um, you have a number, um, an odd number, as a secret key, and a ciphertext is just an integer close to a multiple of that odd number. And the question is whether it encrypts a zero or a one depends on whether the distance between your ciphertext and the nearest prod, the nearest multiple of the secret key, whether that distance is even or odd. Well, that's, as, as describing a, a scheme, it's almost as, as simple as it gets. Uh, your secret is 7, your ciphertext is 15, the distance between 15 and 14, which is the nearest multiple of 7, is 1, so that's an encryption of 1. Um, now, when you multiply two of these numbers or add two of these numbers, this property of uh, whether the distance to the nearest multiple is even or odd actually uh, stays. It actually um, maintains that property as long as you're really close enough to, to the product. Once you get farther away, you get wraparounds and things get destroyed. But you know, if you only need to do one or two multiplications and a few additions, then you can do that on the ciphertexts, and uh, it would still uh, remain uh, this property of whether the distance to the nearest uh, multiple is, is even or odd would still remain. <laughs> so this is an example of a somewhat homomorphic encryption. And then there is the question of why would that be a secure encryption? And you can show that if some particular thing is hard to do, then this encryption scheme uh, is secure. But that would be maybe the simplest example of something which is plausibly secure and allows you to do a few additions and, and and then there's a big transformation to go from this to something that allows you to do any functions like that. The, the question for me is not the ease or difficulty of the encryption. It, it's this function that you're saying is going into the cloud, and then for some reason it's still encrypted. And the cloud has enough information to do something with that and to be able to send back information without 
uh, equal, being able to somehow know what's going on in the cloud. You know, right. it's, it's this so, mysterious uh, mystery. Yeah. So that, that, there is one thing that I didn't say and maybe should have uh, about expressing a function, uh, a function as a Boolean circuit. There are some things, when you express something as a Boolean circuit, there are some things that, some operations that you may want to do that are ruled out of the bet. So for example, think of just uh, index in, into the array, this private information retrieval thing that I was Now think about expressing that as a circuit. You, this, the input to the circuit have to be all the entries of your array, because if the index is five, then the, the fifth entry has to be an input. And similarly for every other entry. Which means that if you want to process that as a, as, a, as a Boolean circuit, you're going to have to do some operation on each and every one of the entries of this array. So essentially what you do is you, do, you build a big, big multiplexer and you feed in all the entries of the array in it and out comes the answer. But this is what you're going to have to implement right now in crypto. You're going to encrypt, the multiplexer is a bunch of ends and all, and you're going to encrypt all of that. And nobody would know which entry you chose simply because you did the operation on all the entries. Uh, for that kind of thing, it's not practical. You can, again, you can use it as a tool to do some of the work and use other technology for doing something else. But if you're going to actually use the morphic encryption or something, you better make sure that amount of data that's applied to is not too large. Uh, so you're going to maybe you keep a part of your system that remove that reduces the amount of error and only then apply one more communication. Uh, that actually trying to engineer systems so that <laughs> you can use homomorphic encryption at some level of it is something that we do in, in particular uh, in particular the um, problem domains. So sometimes it's possible. There are cases where homomorphic encryption can help you do something but use it in the Google map, uh, in the map server uh, example, yeah, that's, I doubt that's ever going to be possible. So uh, my understanding of the MIT crypto DB and this onion approach is that uh, you start with an outer layer of data that might not be so sensitive. Let's say it's an e-commerce application and maybe your address information is encrypted with a, uh, AES encryption or something like that. And then as you get down to the more delicate information, like the credit card data, maybe that's encrypted homomorphically. And then to follow up to that, what's your, what's your guess for when uh, this might be realistic, given how fast uh, processing speed is improving and, and memory? When, when is the algorithm optimization going to meet the computing horsepower to make this practice? So, two things. First of all, the MIT crypto, I, I don't know the technology. My reading of that. Forbes article was a little different. They actually used the different layers because some encryption schemes can only support additions, others can only support multiplication, so we're going to encrypt it twice and do the additions here the multiplications there. That was my understanding, but again, I, I don't know that. I don't know what the technology is doing. Uh, in terms of when is it going to be practical, I, again, my guess right now is that for some niche applications, you will be able to use it within a few years, three, four years. Uh, in terms of using it the way uh, RSA encryption is used today for a uh, handshake on every SSL and any, any uh, um, HTTP connection, I have no guesses. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Michael, can you hear us? Yes. Great. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to bring your slides up okay. and uh, speak loudly and clearly, and we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Can you refresh the uh, page? I, I changed one slide. Just, uh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Um, hello. I'm, so I'm, um, I'm in Bangkok right now, um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I would like to talk about the Unhosted Project, which is our endeavor to, um, to research how the architecture of the web can be 
better suited for for software in a way that uh, we can have some of the values of software freedom that we have in desktop software. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, it is our understanding that uh, software is evolving from the desktop to the web. Uh, not in that way, but um, we think uh, it's basically a thing that Google um, started to propose, and uh, uh, some people call it cloud. Um, most there, there are a few things that are not called cloud, I think. But um, with this, this evolution of software, what we mean is uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to have a word processor, then you would probably buy it off the, either off the shelf or um, download it and buy the license and install it on your computer. And now it's much more common for a lot of applications to be website. So you go to a website and there you do the thing you want to do with software. So um, well, software in the, in the sense of functionality will it be done more and more with websites, and that's in that will install software. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So, on the desktop, on your computer, you have these uh, applications, and you have data storage. Your files are on your hard disk, and um, the What's that? I, I just saw a message there. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so, on your hard disk, you have these installed applications and you have your file, either in a My Documents folder or in your home folder. Um, the thing is, files are owned by you, they are on your hard disk, and the files are separate from the application. So yeah, if you have a file in a folder somewhere on your hard disk on your computer, and you also have an application on your computer, then you can put the two together and use the file it with that application. And then you have another application that you can make that combination between application and data yourself again with the other application. So it's entirely there's no locking between application and data. Uh, next slide, please. So, as software uh, functionality moves from installed programs to web-based services, the data is being locked into those applications. So now, if we go to the website, um, the data that we use with that website is um, is inside the uh, application. So yeah, we propose a better architecture. Um, next slide, please. Next. So um, yeah, this is a bit of animation. So um, you can. Um, this is the way it is now. Next slide, please. And this is what we propose. So have a storage somewhere in the cloud, which is your My Documents folder. Uh, that works with all these websites. Uh, next slide, please. So you go to a website and that loads into your browser. Next slide. And then the data is fetched from this remote storage. And uh, you can use your that website with your own data storage, your remote storage. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next slide. So that's our proposal. Separate cloud storage from cloud app logic. Uh, it's a very simple idea, and um, we've been just been researching how we do work and trying to make proof of concept uh, implementation of this. Uh, next slide, please. So what we came up with is called the remote storage. Um, the most important part is that data storage should be available cross-origin. 
on the web, um, the separation uh, between websites is an important part of the security architecture, which means that one website cannot do, um, cannot access websites from another origin, from another um, domain name. So there is a um, uh, there are ways around this where you can specify exceptions for cross-origin resource sharing, and we promote that all data storage uh, make itself available across origin. So we standardize this and that's all we did. That's all we do. We say all data storage should um, implement our standards and then websites can become compatible with data storage of that set. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the important thing um, about this is that the application runs in the browser and not on the server. Um, you could have, you, yeah, you could have already have some active freedom if websites would uh, connect their servers to the storage that you choose. But we think it's even better if the application is just um, static HTML, JavaScript, and CSS that your browser loads and it runs in the browser and it connects to the data from your browser using cross-origin data. So that's why we use JavaScript as a, 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 a platform for, um, for writing the application mode if you just then it can run in the browser instead of on the server. Next slide, please. So WebFinger is a, uh, a protocol that's very simple all it does is link an XML file to an email address. So it defines a way in which, through an email address, you link an XML file in which you can specify um, whatever you want to say about that email address. And we use that to announce where a person's remote storage is. Uh -huh. So that the user can put their email address into the application as a normal login procedure. And then the application can discover, saying, oh, I see you have remote storage there, and then connect to it. Next slide, please. So the way the application gets access to data storage is with OAuth. OAuth 2 has a client site flow called the Epiphic Grand Flow, by which uh, the application behind the browser can back to the storage and come back uh, and have a token without die on the server to do any sort of server communication. So that's how you, you said yes, allow this application to access my storage, and then uh, pop up closes, and then put that, that application in your browser has token to access. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, an important part of our um, the cross origin disorder. Um, the storage is announced to the browser that the data that it's serving is okay to display in other origins. Um, so normally a browser would allow you to make cross-origin data calls, but with voice headers, uh, you specifically opt in to the resource, tells the browser this data is okay to display in any uh, sound or any video. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the data storage that is being uh, shared this way is just a very simple to get to the HTTP interface. Uh, we're not uh, considering advanced queries uh, or all that, just to keep it simple for now. We might do that later, um, uh, but for now we're just considering a subset of web data with very basic uh, the ACTP protocol itself, really, and it's just about itself, cat food, or a key value store. And that's all we need to store user data remotely uh, from the application. Um, so that's the standard. So next slide, please. Uh, this is, um, I, I did this myself, as you can probably tell. 
this is the flow of how it works um, when you log into a website that accepts the So the um, number one is you put in the URLs confirmed to the application. Number two is it fetches static application from the, uh, the uh, server and that loads into your browser. So the, all the server does is serve the static file. Um, and number three is where you put in your email address. And number four is where it looks up the web finger files and the XML file link to the email address. Uh, number five, it gets back some information. Um, number six, uh, seven and eight is the OAuth dance where the application gets an echo from the phone story. And then um, nine is where it tells, it accesses the data using that OAuth code. Um, so uh, the basic kind of theory is that there's a separation between the application server and the store server. And using WebFinger, OAuth, and cross storage and resource sharing, the application is able to access that remote storage from a browser context. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. We're there, yep. Adoption? No, no more slides? Uh, uh, no, adoption we're on. Adoption storage. Uh, Can you see it? Mm, no. Uh, uh, Iris Couch user address. <laughs> oh, oh I don't, that's weird. I don't see that. I still see the last time. Okay. Um, oh, can you see me? Uh, I have the. Oh, no, yeah. oh, I see. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. I, it was just not refreshing the screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. So, um, the, obviously, defining the standard is one thing. And um, we could just. Um, is to say, okay, this is standard, we, we wrote it, now we go back to work. Um, but that wouldn't solve anything. So we, we, now we're campaigning to actually make people use it. So obviously the standard defines an interface between application and storage. So we need to adopt it on both sides. And that obviously gives a, a application bump, um at feature and the level the market share of people who have storage and the other way around storage provider won't add it until they have a significant part of their user base who demand it because they want to use the good existing application. Uh, so to try to break that deadlock, um, we teamed up with Iris Pat, who are a um, they are, they're part of the um, a group of people who developed Couch TV and uh, they offer free Couch TV uh, plastic. So we're um, making them compatible so that it's very easy for people to get uh, uh, remote storage from Iris now. So by, by getting a, an, an easy to use premium provider, uh, it will be easy for anybody who wants to use um, an application to have remote storage at Iris Cloud. Um User address is a project which we've been working on this week, uh, which is not entirely clear how it's going to go forward. But the idea is that if your user address is on a domain that does not support web finger, then we want to provide a centralized fallback so that we can still link your user address to your storage, even though you don't have. Uh, the option to run the web finger uh, because maybe you're on a Hotmail address and Hotmail doesn't do that thing. Um, Surfnet is the federation of Dutch universities and higher education institutes. And they approached us saying that they wanted to do a pilot giving remote storage to all staff and students of all universities of the Netherlands. So that will be like a million people in, in all of that academia will suddenly have a um, which we hope to be a big boost. Uh, I think email started by people at university. Um, so I'm hoping that with this university system administrator can also 
film or from uh, of giving that music to another service. And uh, yeah, if you run a domain, then please remote search in the music. Next slide, please. Um, on the application side, we're also trying to, um, to move forward on, on development. So we have two applications which are pushing ourselves. Uh, LibreDocs, which is an effort to create an alternative to Google Docs. Um, uh, we started working together with um, people from LibreOffice, and uh, now we have funding. We have our funding as well for uh, working with uh, basically packaging existing software like Eberpad, uh, SVG Edit, and um, existing um, web software. Packaging it so that you can use it with remote storage. And OpenTabs is another project which came from um, discussions that we had in the life of the Occupy Wall Street and um, Bitcoin and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's an application which you can uh, send IOUs to other people and they will be stored on your remote storage system. Uh, we uh, now have a full time person to ask in that as well. So that will be two applications that will work with remote storage. Um, also, we expect to have local storage based applications. Um, just take the, uh, so there are people who develop. And they are easy to you know. Yes, and if you run a web, then please that you know, provide, except unhealthy units. And next slide, please. So, Kevin. Hey, Michael, can you speak just a little bit slower? You're starting to break up a little. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So the, um, I added this slide because it's usually the questions that I get, so I thought I'd, I'd answer them as, as the last slide. Um, the, as we, when we started um, this project, it was all about end-to-end -end encryption, um, and um, it, we sort of, um, we still find that important the possibility of doing end to end encryption on top of this architecture it is still an important um, idea that we think is makes it valuable. Uh, but we're not focusing so much on developing that. Because we think the architecture change is already uh, useful even if you don't encrypt the data. And if we can make it work then uh, putting encryption on top of it can be uh, a set project where uh, you say, okay, this application uses your remote storage and it encrypts all the data before sending it there, so it doesn't matter where your remote storage is, you have to trust that provider. And if you run the application on local host, because it's the static, each of the um, then you would have your data in the cloud both. Uh, and uh, yeah, content addressable indices um, that sort of search basically. The thing you can do easily with a centralized website has all the data inside it is to index everybody's data and add tags and make it searchable so that you can do a query where you get back data from fifth sources. And if you decentralize data, then obviously it's hard to find it back. Um, so you have to make an active effort to maintain content for industry. For instance, if I store something and I tag it with uh, some tag that I want to public, then I would have to separately post to a centralized uh, tag index server which then forms the my storage as uh, one of the results for that query. So if you want to search, then you will still use some sort of centralized uh, um, Push notifications, so uh, send in 
in somehow uh, we haven't uh, included that right now. You can only write to your own story. You cannot write to somebody else's story. And uh, what you have in the life in of, uh, for instance, some type of former XMP by which you can know somebody else there is that awaiting uh, on your story. Uh, but that's also something we have to do separately uh, to get that functionality in a web application. Um, and then the thing can really do is operate from global data. People have been asking us, so they have an application that takes new streams and uh, cloud uh, different elements of those use streams and degroup that uh, they want to do that in an honest way. Um, that's just not very suitable because that data is not owned by anyone and uh, we're basically here for um, uh, some decentralized user data uh, and not public data so much. Because public data is uh, it's, it's not addressable during user service, so it will carry decentralized to. So that's what to give a scope of where this uh, is useful. We can use the data, so for instance, your distant friend, your photos, um, your blog post, everything that is able to be put as a web system uh, and, and an author of the web could be on your remote storage. Uh, and website would allow you to connect to that motor instead of the way it is now on web where every website has um, a not in IP application. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And maybe Let's uh, pull your face up. And uh, I know it's a little bit hard to hear, but does anybody uh, want to try a question for Michael? Okay, I think that's it. Michael, appreciate your time. And, uh, oh, okay. oh, wait, wait, we do have a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, I'm not even sure how it relates, but uh, how would you relate this to data as a service? And I'll say, I don't know much about data as a service, but we have corporate clients that are re-architecting their business to say, okay, you know, software is a service, service oriented architecture, now data is going to be a service. So that has certain levels of abstraction. What you're talking about seems very specific, very direct, so maybe you can talk about how all that might tie together. Did you catch that or not? No, I'm fine. Can you repeat it? Maybe? Yeah, how, how does it relate to the concept of data as a service? You've got software as a service now in the cloud. This seems like a data as a service model. Can you talk, Do you see uh, corporate customers eventually using this as a data as a service model? Right, yeah. Um, I, I haven't really heard that term. Uh, oh, that, that would sort of... Um, Describe this architecture. Yes, I think uh, corporate um, customers could have uh, could have, for instance, say you have a specific application that somebody developed for you, um, which we use to track uh, how many um, hours you sell or whatever. And uh, there's data, and there's an application specifically developed for you, and you want it to be web-based because then it's in the cloud, because um, you would normally use it as software experience. But you could ask, as the company could ask uh, the uh, consultants to say, we want it to be unhosted, so you can develop the application and using the remote storage standard so that we can separately buy the application from you. Uh, we can, because it's the static, we can post the application on our intranet, and then we'll get just storage data as a service, uh, just storage from somewhere compatible with remote storage, and, and people use the application in their browser. And only the data storage is outsourced to the cloud, but the application, uh, we're not um, paying for uh, the application being hosted because that's the static. And that would untie a lot of unclear uh, billing, I think, that comes with software as a service where people 
sell an application um, per month, and and the company probably ends up paying an unreasonable amount for the hosting that they get from software as a service. So I'm definitely think, uh, yeah, data as a service that makes sense. We're we're looking into uh, making getting people to implement this in uh, for European. Um, governments, institutions, or people who have sensitive data. Um, in Europe, there is a bit of a, a concern now about if they get software from American companies, then that's subject to the Patriot Act. So um, they um, they are interested in other uh, uh, cloud syndicates. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I think it does. A good question. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, again, you, forgive me if I ask a sort of naive question here, but you know, we can adjust. Um, I looked at that diagram, step one to step ten of the, um, and the web finger seems to be like the key uh, step. Once you um, associate the web finger. You email with your files, everything occurs like any other system. Is that correct? So, he, did you hear the question? Webfinger is kind of the key step, and once you associate your email address, everything happens like normal. Uh, yeah, so by associating your storage to your email address, the login step, usually when you go to a website, you put in your email address and your password, and that's how you start your interaction with that website. Okay, so, so well, we take advantage of that. Okay, what would so hang, hang on, Michael. What okay. would be the security weakness of that approach? Are there security weaknesses to that approach? Um, Do you have something I, like be storing the email in your browser? Or, no, uh, just, I, just thinking aloud. He's just kind of thinking aloud. Once you're authenticated, there's. Are there. The, go ahead. The security comes from OLAW. So you can put in anybody's email address. And then you'll be redirected to their OAuth dialog, and then you'll be asked to log into your storage and to click allow this application to connect to my storage. And that's where the user will put in the password to their storage and give access, give out an OAuth token to the application. And uh, they could later revoke that OAuth token uh, if they no longer want to use that application. OAuth, if you're not familiar with OAuth, it's a it's kind of a new industry standard for web security. Google supports it and several others. You can do research on OAuth and you'll you'll find information out. I think we have one more question over here still? Yeah. Well uh, if you know people explain the difference between this scheme and say Google separating an application <coughs> from a data store such that you know the data is made available through say a West RESTful web service. So you get the JSON data over HTTP and you know I could be running a thick client that connects to that data or be another web based application on another site, why do we have to go through this sort of elaborate and hosting approach? So the question is how is this different from a service oriented architecture where you simply have a restful uh, interface uh, where you're accessing perhaps your data that way? What, what makes this different or better than that? Oh, it, it is just a restful interface. Um, the, the components, it tries to be as simple as possible. Um, so the only thing that adds to this RESTful interface is the cross-origin headers so that you can access it directly from the browser instead of having a server in between uh, the browser and the, the, the web service. And all of, so that you can authenticate um, uh, against that web service and web finger so you can discover it. Uh, because we want the storage to be per user, so that's why we want to link it to a address. But otherwise, it is just a web server, a restful web service. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more in the back? Yeah. Uh, in the time range, you think that there's only one remote data source from web finger. Can there be multiple data source status and then the web browser having intelligence to assemble them? Right, so that, that was actually a question that came to my mind as well. Is it possible to have multiple distributed data sources and then have the browser kind of aggregate and communicate with multiple sources at the same time? 
Um, yeah, we, um, well, there um, three answers to that, I think. Uh, you, so you can have, um, one thing is you could have multiple redundant storage locations where you say, I don't want to rely on one storage provider. I just want to um, announce a sample one. So I um, we just didn't do that yet because uh, we want to get it working with one storage bus first and then define how we can maybe brand from it or whatever. Another way is you can have um, different, you can access the storage of other users. Like if you're reading somebody else's um, profile, then instead of connecting to your own storage, your browser will connect to this other person's storage. So, um, depending on how much you interact with other people, the browser will be connecting to different storage locations all the time as it aggregates uh, data from different users. Um, and the third interpretation would be, if you already have your data in different places, like some of your files are in Dropbox, others are in Facebook, others in Flickr, then you could tie them all to your uh, user address and have them all aggregated into one big pool that way. And that, that makes each easier to organize your own data wherever you have it. So that's all, that, those are all possibilities that that would be. Great, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, well, Michael, we appreciate your patience and for joining us uh, from all the way around the world. I guess it's around 7.30, 7.30 in the morning over there. So uh, thank yes. you, Michael. And uh, take care. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.